Hey, hey, hey guys, it's your favorite coach, Tamika James. I am in the building with Miss Audrey Bell Kearney. We are here to share who she is with the world. So I'm really excited about interviewing her today. So without further ado, let me introduce to you one more time, Miss Audrey Bell Kearney. Hey. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Happy to be here. Thank you so much. Well, listen, um, I like for um, my um, my guests to just go ahead and int introduce themselves. I like to do that because I know that there's something that you want the world to know about you. And I just want you to just let us know. So where are you right now? Like what's happening in your life and in your business? Well, right now, girl, I am in the process of launching a course. So, so she asked me, so I'm going to, I'm in the process of launching a course called the Podcast Branding Academy. And um, I've been a podcaster since about 2009, 2008, 2009, when it first got started, we only had blog talk radio. It's so funny because that's the only platform we had at that time. And um, I've learned a lot over the years about that. I've been an entrepreneur for 24 years, 22 of those years, full time working from home. So I'm, I'm just I've been working from home for a very long time. And so um, I right now I am working on a couple of different things. I'm a podcaster myself. I love this space. People that know me know I love podcasting. So you're doing a great thing. You're, you came in at the right time because the industry is about to explode. I've been podcasting. I was a podcast here in Good Morning in uh, Gwinnett County called Good Morning Gwinnett. And it was so funny. I interviewed somebody. And it's like, oh, you're in Gwinnett County? This was around the election time. Like, yeah, you guys are in the news. I was like, I know, I know. Um, so I, I host that podcast and I'm about to launch a new podcast called Wise Women Invest. I'm a financial advisor by trade, um, but a podcaster by love. And so I have to marry my two things together. So, you know, that's just a little bit about what I'm doing right now, but been in this space for a long time. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing. So I'm, I'm really excited about making sure that the people who listen are getting some information about particular businesses, like how they run the specifics, the things they should stay away from, all of those great things. So let's start talking about, so is your, your main thing podcasting or your main thing, the financial stuff? My main thing is media and marketing. That's my main thing. Okay. Um, right. I am a financial advisor by trade. So I decided to, um, when the pen, let me, let me just back up. When I was a little girl, my mom and, I, and I'm assuming she got it from her mom. She was a big believer in insurance, right? My mm -hmm. mom had insurance for pretty much everything. When she, she had breast cancer twice. And when she had breast cancer, she was out of work. And she had insurance to pay her card note. She had insurance to pay her credit card. She had insurance for everything. So she instilled in my brother and I that you need to have insurance for everything. When the pandemic hit, and I, and I lost my mom to COVID in January, January 5th, we all got it. The baby went to daycare. And someone exposed the baby and the baby exposed it to all of us on Christmas. And we all got sick and I lost my mom, my whole family. We were all together, had made it through the whole year. Baby went to daycare. They called my daughter on December the 18th and said someone exposed her. But someone in the school had it, but they weren't by her. Three days later, we all had it. And my mom passed away in January. So, But I said all that to say my mom had insurance. And what happened was a lot of people suffered during the pandemic. They suffered for a bunch of different reasons. One, they didn't have investments, right? If you had investments in your portfolio, you would be fine right now. My husband and I, we got investments. So we didn't suffer. Like we didn't go through a lot of the things, but a lot of people did. And I was talking to a friend of mine who's also a financial advisor. And she was telling me how she was really helping people. And I wanted to do something that really helped people. And she was telling me how she was really helping people you know, put life insurance in place, put investments in place so that they don't have to be, you know, caught out there if something else should happen. And I said, you know what? I've been holding these licenses for a while now. Maybe I need to do something with them. And so that's why I decided to launch the Wise Women Invest podcast, because I really want to educate people. And I know that podcasting is a great platform to share information, to share stories and to educate people. I know that. So it's kind of like, I know that's a long answer to a short question, but yeah. I'm passionate about podcasting. But right now I need to feel like I'm doing something that matters. My mom lost. Today's her birthday. So oh, that's happy another birthday. I know. Today's her birthday. So it's kind of like, man, I got a lot going on right now, but, and I podcast on the day she passed away. Like she passed at 5 15 that morning. I did my podcast at 10 o'clock. And that was that, you know, to me, 
she know I love podcasting. So I love mm -hmm. podcasting, but I also I'm in a position right now where I really want to help people learn how to make their money grow for them while they're working hard for it. Let learn how to let it work hard for you and not get caught up out like that, because, you know, mm -hmm. We don't know when the next pandemic is going to hit. We don't know when the next disaster is going to hit us. All kinds of things are happening in the world right now. And so my goal right now, I'm on a mission to help 1 million women learn how to invest. Whether they invest 25 cents or $25 or 250 they need to know what that looks like. I remember when I was working at Prudential, they sent me a way to, because um, I've been in financial services for a long time. They sent me a way to a, a weekend camp. And that's when I learned about the stock market. I didn't know what a ticker was. You know, it was called a minority interchange. I was a part of that group. And they sent me away to this camp and I learned about investing. And I was, when the instructor guy finished talking, I wanted to stay because I was so enthralled in what she was saying. So that's what I want to do right now. I need to make podcasts really make a difference in people's lives. So that's why Wise Women Invest is born. Well, you said that you don't know if you're helping people or not. You're like, I'm doing this thing, but I don't really know. Yeah, well, let me tell you, from my perspective, you are helping people. And let me tell you one reason that I have observed. When you said that your mom um, ended up passing away and you podcasted on that same day, you just said to the entire world, you must keep going. Yeah. You must honor those who knew what you were doing in this world. You must honor them. You must also honor yourself and you you have to just um, just keep rolling because yeah. tomorrow is going to, you know, you are hoping that and looking forward to tomorrow coming for you. So you can't stop today. Yeah. So for me, when I heard that that story, that was what it said. So there's someone who is going to go through exactly the same thing because we're still in a pandemic. Mm -hmm. Someone's going to need to do something that's going to impact someone else. And, and you did just that. So I want to tell you, thank you for um, your strength. And I know you're probably like, I bet you you're a person that's like, they're always calling me strong. They're always calling me strong because I, I can do that. Just so you know. But um, yeah, um, thank you for your strength and thank you for continuing on. That was that was a, that meant a lot to a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You know, my mom was a my mom was she was five feet tall, but she was a fighter. And she fought for nine days for her life, you know, but I think she she was all she had underlying issues. And um, mm -hmm. and I think she just got tired of fighting. And it was crazy because my brothers, two of us, my brother got a dream. Like right when she was transitioning, he had a dream and he said she came to him in a dream and she hugged him and said, I'm, I'm OK. And he thought she was going to pull through and she died the next day. And I was like, but she was a fighter, like she fought to the very end. So, you know, that's what. That's what she instilled in us. She moved me to Newark when I was a little girl, you know, and, you know, growing up in Newark, you got to fight. You know, I went, yeah. I went to West Side. You got to know, you got to know how to handle some things. And so, and if you've never gone to Newark, take a visit. You know, you got to know how to handle take yourself. Take a visit. You'll find out. Yes, we're both You're from right. New Jersey. We're both from the same area. So, yeah. 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 You have to know how to handle yourself. Yeah. And that was great to find out about you that we have that in common as well. So, yeah, you know, we, we're, I just call it six degrees of separation. There's so many great people out here. So we had some really good conversations about a lot of things. And um, I just appreciate who you are and your position. I want to share with everyone right now that from our very first conversation, you share with me so much information and I can only imagine how much you give when you're podcasting. I can just only imagine after the, the conversation that we had, literally like we were talking, but I was like taking notes. I was like, <laughs> these are some teachable moments. And I just want to tell you, thank you for sharing that information with me. I say that for a lot of reasons publicly, because there are a lot of people in this world who do not want to share what they mm -hmm. know with someone else for the fear that someone's going to get further than them. And you are not one of those people. So I just want to tell you, thank you. You're just welcome. So great here. And I was really excited to interview you, by the way, just so you know. Okay. Well, so thank you. Thank you so much. Let me tell you, Tamika, I met a guy, he was about a hundred years old. Seriously. No, he's about 85, 90. We were in the grocery store <laughs> and it was the weirdest thing. I'm standing by the meets, my husband, my daughter, and myself. And the man just comes up and he just starts to talk, right? And so when I started to talk, he's like, oh, you're a Yankee. 
So my daughter looking at me like, what the heck is a Yankee? I was like, that means we're from up north. So she, I was like, yeah, I'm from Jersey. He's like, yeah, I was, he started talking about his World War II days and all this stuff. And so he said, you know, and I always wanted to write a book. So my husband and daughter was standing like right here, like, oh God, we're never going to get out of the grocery store. Now it was hilarious. So I'm telling him like, this is what you need to do to write the book. You need to do this, this. And they were like, we're going to the car. And they left me in the grocery store talking to the man so I could tell him how to write. It was so, but that's just me all the time. And, you know, I, this is what I feel. I feel like we all have our experiences and we all have information to share. You can you can give it to people all day long. What are they going to do with it? And a lot of times, Samika, now you, you're a go-getter. You probably would take some of that stuff like, you know what, I need to use this. But most people won't. And I don't I don't fear that stuff. Like I don't I don't fear sharing because what's for you is for you and what's for me is for me. And I'm okay with that. I've seen people, there's a woman, I don't know if you know her. She's really nice. Her name is Lucinda Cross. Do you know her? She does like the vision board. And she was big for a second. Like she does it's something called vision board something, but she created this kit, um, this vision board kit, and she was all over the place. She was on Queen Um. They had a they had a um, a reality show called Queen Bee I think it was it was produced by Spike Lee's wife I think it was called Queen Bee if you didn't get a chance it was pretty cool and um the judge that's down here in Atlanta I forgot her name it was all right but anyway she and I met each other because we had a coach his name was Andrew Morrison he was our both of our coach she became his assistant now we were at the same level at the same time she shot past me. And you would think I would lose my mind, but she that was because she got very clear about what she was doing and, and how to do it. Me, I was trying to be everything to everybody. So she went right past me. That didn't that can hurt my feelings. Like, man, I need to get clear. You know, that's what I said to myself. I need to get clear. She shot past me. She was doing some amazing things. And all I kept doing was giving her accolades. Like, girl, you're killing it. Because she was. But that was because she was very clear about what her thing was a vision board. Like, she picked the vision board and she ran with the vision board. Me, I was a coach. I was an inventor. I was all these things. I'm like, all over. I had this beautiful website that nobody knew what I did because it was crazy. So I don't mind sharing because it's what you do with it that matters. Yeah, thank you for that. That was a whole business tip there because the clarity is really important. And um, yeah, and the connections that we make are really important too. So that all, to me, that that's what was in that story you just told. So yeah. I want to talk about um, one of the things you said that's really important to you is to share information about um, investments. Do you have an investment tip that you would like to share with everyone today? So we yes, can do that too. Do your thing with sharing with the world. <laughs> Do your homework. Here's the thing I could tell you about investments, right? You really need to be an educated person when it comes to investing because it's different things for everybody. So I'll give you a prime example. When my daughter was pregnant, right out the womb, like before the baby was born, I was like, listen, you have to do what I did not do. You have to make sure you have life insurance on yourself. You're going to put a rider on the baby right out the gate. And she did exactly what I said. She and her boyfriend, we sat to the table and I said, this is why. If something should happen to you, if something should happen to me, nobody has to struggle to take care of Carter. Her, her daughter's name is Carter. My grandbaby name is Carter. Nobody has to struggle to take care of Carter because she's going to, you have this in place. So she did it right out the gate. Do your homework. Understand your financial situation before you start to invest. Don't take all your money in the bank, right? Because I see this happen all the time. And, I, and I've and i seen it happen right now with the Dogecoin craze right now. Everybody's crazy. They want to buy Dogecoin. People taking money out their 401ks to put it in Dogecoin. Why would you do that? Don't do that. Do not do that. Because Dogecoin is volatile. It's not even really anything really for real yet. It may be like Bitcoin, but it is not like Bitcoin. So if you got money growing on the 401k, leave it there and make some extra money and then put it into Dogecoin. But here's the other thing. And this is my final tip on this. Do not invest money you cannot afford to lose. Don't do that. Hallelujah. Don't do it. Don't do it. If you can't invest, if you cannot afford to lose that money, don't invest it. Because the stock market is not guaranteed. Now, on the flip side of that, if you got a little chunk of change, you know, you want to put it somewhere, look at a fixed index annuity. It's going to stay fixed right there, but you can't get it out until you turn 59 and a half. But it's going to stay fixed right there. When the market goes up, your money goes up. When the market goes down, your money stays the same. That's a fixed index annuity. But do your homework and find out what product is going to help you reach your financial goals. So that's my financial tip. So you call that a fixed index annuity? What is that? Fixed index, fixed annuity? index annuity. And what okay. that does is you can put $25,000 in and sit it 
and it's going to stay there to 59 and a half. You can, you can make sure your beneficiaries get it. If something happens to you, let me mm -hmm. tell you something that happened to us recently. My mom had a ton of insurance for everything. She just did mm -hmm. on her job when she retired. And this has happened to my uncle too. Now my uncle is still alive, but when it happened to her, I said to him, Hey, we need, may need to check this out. And we did. My mom retired. She was a, uh, she worked at Essex County Youth Detention Center in, in Jersey. She retired from there. She had a pension, right? So she got her pension money every month. When she passed away, my brother and I were the beneficiaries on her pension, right? Okay. When we talked to the beneficiary, when we talked to the to Essex County, to the to, to the state of Georgia, Jersey, they were like, "Yeah, you don't get that." We was like, "Well, we beneficiaries." Like, "Yeah," but what happened was she signed off on all the money going to her, and if something happened to her, it went back to the state. What? Yes. So I said you know, to my uncle, I said, "This is what happened." He said, "Well, let me check my pension." He signed up on the same thing. Now he's still alive, and he cannot change it. So you what? need to understand. Yes, you can. He cannot change it. So you need to understand when these parameters are put in place. I got a pension, and when I die, my my brothers said, no, they're not. If it's not set up the right way, they will not get it. So if you elect, if your person elected to take the full benefit right now where they're alive, no matter if they got a hundred thousand dollars left and they die, it goes back to the company or goes back to the state. That's But those are the things, I didn't even know that until now. So this is why I feel like this is really important. I can tell you right now, there's something going on right now, like right now in my family, right? And it's, in, it's involving a lot. Have a will in place and be very specific. Okay. Have a will and be very specific in that will and make sure that two people at least that you trust has access to that will. That's very important. Tell, tell me one thing that, that should be, at least one thing that should be specific in a will. Very specific. Who gets what? So if you have a business, Tamika, and you do, you have a, a multi-million dollar business, right? If you got, let's say you got two kids. One of them is a straight sleuth and the other one is a good one. That will needs to be very specific. Johnny over here who does nothing, he gets on a, he gets a trust and he gets his money every month. He gets $300 a month to go towards whatever. Jenny over here, she's good. She's good with money. She's a good person. I want you to give her quarterly this amount of money. That specific. That's okay. it, that's what we're going through right now. And, it's, and it is not specific. So now the, the attorney's got to get involved, all this kind of stuff. But it needs to be that specific. I set a will up for my, I set a will up for my uncle um, mm -hmm. back in 2003. I set his will up for him. He had no children. Right. And it was very specific. So when he passed in 2009, there were no questions. The will popped out. This is what the will says. And my mom and him were very close. So everything went right to her and my uncle that I was just talking about. It went right to them. People wanted to fight. You can't fight. It's in the will. But he, so where do you keep a will? Where Where is the safest place to keep a will? Well, now we have digital vaults. You can keep it in a digital vault. You can keep it in a, at a at a um at a bank inside of a um what do you call it safe safe deposit safe box. Deposit box. Mm -hmm. Or you can get it to a trustee and they have or, or an attorney. So right now the situation that we're in right now, there's two people. There's a trustee and there's an attorney on this this particular uh, uh I won't say an account, but on this what's going on right now. So that there's different places to put it. You can have your will recorded at state, but then that's going to make your information public. Mm hmm. So I don't know if you want your business out there because now they see how much money's there and somebody could pick you up. Let me give you a story. And I just got this story the other day. I thought that was, I was like, so I was talking to, I interviewed my partner, one of my business partners. She's a financial advisor. And she told the story of this woman who was getting a divorce. She had a $250,000 policy on her husband, but they were getting a divorce. So she thought because they were getting a divorce that she had to drop the policy. And, and she told her, no, you don't have to drop it. You can actually increase it because you still have financial attachments to him because you guys have a kid together and so the mm -hmm. husband agreed because they were it was an amicable divorce like they weren't beefing or anything so he agreed to up the, from 250 to a million dollars and then two weeks later he paid. and i was like so you know i'm like really so she got the million dollars because he died when, when the posse went in force but i kind of felt I'm like wait a minute now i'm kind of feeling like suspect that like that was kind of convenient but i said all that to say those are the type of things we need to understand. And a lot of us still don't understand. Now, I do believe that we are, especially African-Americans, we are really waking up to these things. And um, But I need to make sure that I'm doing my part to help. 
So your your new podcast, you share this information with everyone? Yes, I'll be sharing all this information with everyone, but going a little bit deeper because I, I love the whole fact of I'm in I'm in, I'm in a frenzy right now buying land, right? It's like I'm looking at land all over the place. And so one of the one of the things I've set up is a membership where um part of our membership goes into an investment an investment club so we can buy different things real estate you know stocks whatever that's the other part too I'm, I'm, wait I'm clarify lucky. that for me clarify that okay so what I decided to do was and you know it was crazy because I feel like when when things are meant to be they kind of just come together it just came together I was like okay I'm gonna be talking about about investing right but I need to be able to be talk to my people in a private place I'm not a big fan of Facebook for social stuff like I'll go in there and do ads because it's powerful but I'm not I don't hang out there very often and so I decided I wanted to start a membership um, an investment membership where people can learn they can join for free just to, just to be in the community if you want to get on our monthly calls and learn about investing like deep that's that's another level but if you want to be a part of this investment club, then you pay a little bit more and we take part of the investment and put it into real investments. And so for the individuals for as a club, as a collective. So wait, but how does that work if it's as a collective? Because it's an investment club. So, you know, you got family investment clubs, how you set the investment clubs, you guys pick the stocks together. Y'all go through the cheats together. I look at all the terms, all that stuff. That's exactly how it would be set up. And so, so whoever's involved gets a portion of the yes okay. of the portfolio. So everybody is a part of the portfolio. And but but I had to cap it. I was like, I don't want to be with all them people. So I had to cap it at a certain amount of people. And so that was my thing. Like collectively, we can do more. If we think about group economics, we could do more, right? Like there's a there's a, I don't know if you heard about the people down here in Atlanta that bought the the the, the 90, 96 acres of land, the, the families, the 19 families. When I heard that story, I was like, I, I, so I called. I called the president. I think her name is Renee. I was like, hey, I'm in Georgia. Like, I need to know, like, what this was last summer. My husband and I were about to go camp out in the middle of nowhere with them because I wanted to know how can I be a part of that. And yeah. so she said, you know, right now it's you can come to the picnic on the land out. So here, here I am speaking. Like, is there a bathroom? She's like, she's like, sis. <laughs> She's like, sis, there is no bathroom. We are camping, like really camping. And I was like, oh, okay. So there's no glamping. She's like, my partner, she glamps. The rest of us, we camp. But they bought 96 acres of land. And it was and it is in Toomsbury, Georgia. Toomsboro. And when I first moved to Georgia, I read that in a magazine about this town that was up for sale. So I told my husband, town is up for sale for like $2 million. And so we drove out to Toomsboro. And I was like, let's go out there. We went out there and I was like, oh, yeah, this is in the middle of the country. Like, it's like two hours away from Atlanta. It was in the middle. They got together and said, you know what? As a collective, let's buy this 96 acres. Mm -hmm. And when I read that story, I knew exactly what they were talking about. I was like, man, I wish I had known about that, but I didn't know. And so after that happened, they, it went crazy. They just, everybody was trying to talk to them and they still do. They have since, Tamika, bought 400 more acres. Wow. They pretty much own the whole freaking town for real. They bought 400 more acres. So that type of economic development, group development, group economics, that's what I'm looking for. You know, I know I'm starting out small with a small group of like-minded women, and that's my goal. But here's mm -hmm. the thing. When we empower one, we can empower many, right? But we need to understand. We need to understand what that looks like. So I'll be bringing on other experts in di different industries. There's a young lady here in Georgia I'm a member of the Atlanta Black Chamber. I sit on the um the the, the media board. She is killing it in cannabis. She lives in Georgia. Her cannabis mm -hmm. farm is in California. She is okay. killing it. We need to understand that. We need to understand exactly. And she can tell us because she is killing it right now. So I'm going to bring those type of people on the show to talk about that stuff. And, and to educate us on that, because we need to know, like it's going to happen. Like Georgia is one of those states where they're saying we're not. It's not going to be legal. It's not. Gonna, it's going to be legal. Like when we get our governor out, it's going to be legal, and we <laughs> need to be in the forefront of that. So you know, that's what I plan on doing. Yeah. So wow, I want to ask you the question about entrepreneurship because you are right now proving to us that you are a true entrepreneur. So. <laughs> Where did you begin, like becoming an entrepreneur? Like, what happened for you to determine that? Oh, this is what I want to do: be an entrepreneur. I'm, I'm gonna tell you what happened. So, 
when I got out. So, so I was, I was like, like, you're about to tell us a story. I'm about to say, because it's a crazy, when I think about the story, it's a crazy story. Because I have to call it before we start. Tell us yeah. a bedtime story about okay. you becoming an entrepreneur. So once upon a time, there was this really smart girl, right? When she graduated out of the eighth grade, she could have went to a private school because she was really smart. But she didn't because her mother didn't want her to go away to a private school in ninth grade. So she went to the public high school in Newark, New Jersey. So I get the public high school. I went to West Side. Shout out to the Rough Riders in Jersey. Went to West Side. <laughs> and um, I was number two coming into West Side. And when I got the West Side, I was like, I ain't going to class. I'm going to hang out. This is me. But I did not. That was in my, my freshman year. I did really well. My sophomore year. Oh, yeah, I was buck wild. Had to go to summer school. After I went to summer school, I was like, nah, I don't like summer school. And I straightened up and I flew right. And so I could have probably graduated at the top of my class, but I graduated number 22 out of 275. So I'm still not bad. I was in the top 25. Not bad. I was still in the top 25. Went to Montclair State. I was really good in science and, and math. And so my, my guidance counselor told me to go be an accountant, right? I don't like being bored. So I go to college to be an accountant. And I'm taking these classes that I hate. And I fell them all in the first year. And they kicked me out. Oh, and my, no. mother goes, my mother goes, what were you doing? So she's like, up there with them rowdy, rough riders. Y'all not doing anything. All I did to me, because I was like, I don't like any of them classes. All I did was play space, eat sunflower seeds, and drink orange juice for one whole year. That's what I did. That's what I did. And they kicked me out. And then I cried like a baby. And so my mom was working at United Hospital in Newark. And she said, well, let me talk to, her name was Miss Gordine. Miss Gordine was the head of human resources. Let me talk to Miss Gordine and see, can I get you in here? Miss Gordine got me in. I started out at food service, right? Hot as heck in the kitchen on the trade line. The tray come through, the steam hitting me in my, I'm hot. Oh, no. I was like, <laughs> Can't stay in this position because it's too hot in the steam room. I moved up to x-ray, went to x-ray, stayed in x-ray for eight and a half years. I went to school to be a nurse. Right. My mom said, why are you going to school to be a nurse? You can't even stay in the sight of nothing. I was like, nah, they make a lot of money. They, they work three days a week. I want to be a nurse. Mm -hmm. And so I went to school to be a nurse. And lo and behold, went through two years of college to be a nurse. Got to my clinicals. Get to my first day of clinicals. The first thing we had to do was change a colostomy bag. Oh, when they told me that I was standing outside the door, no lie, my back to the wall. Like, I'm not going in there. I'm not changing the colostomy bag. And I quit nursing school that day. <laughs> I was like, can't do it. It's not gonna happen. I ain't gonna I, I gag at everything. I'm like, it's not gonna happen. The Quit best story. story. Oh my goodness. So <sighs> I went to work at so the hospital filed bankruptcy and everybody started to lose their job and nobody knew how to do that. that. I remember yep. that. Mm -hmm. Nobody, nobody everybody started losing their job. I started a resume business doing resumes because I had a built-in audience of hundreds of people who were trying to get jobs. So I went okay. to state schools. I bought this really pretty paper with the gold trimming around and I was just doing resumes like crazy because I'm losing my job too. So I got to make money too. I had a daughter at the time and um, I, I I was like, I got to make this money. So I'm doing resumes, resumes. Everybody come to me, go to Oregon. She do a resume. I'm doing resume. That's how it started. I didn't even realize it was a business at the time. I didn't right. really realize what entrepreneurship was until I went to work at Prudential. I went to work at Prudential and there was a girl who had an Avon book on her desk. And I took her Avon book and started arting Avon. She's like, you should do this business. I'm like, I don't want to do Avon. I ain't selling Avon, right? So I'm, I'm telling you. So she left. And so all those people who like Avon didn't have an Avon rep anymore. I the started doing Avon. That keep happening right in front of you. Right in front of me. I took the Avon rep and I'm packing Avon bags at home like crazy. But here's the thing about Avon. If you like anything in Avon, you're not going to make any money because all my money went back into Avon. Like I started spending all my money in Avon. And then Prudential, I was working in, in Island at the time, which is about, I lived in, at that time I lived in West Orange. So that was about a 30 to 40 minute hike every morning to Island. They decided they wanted to move to Cranberry, which is down by Great Adventure. Okay, and I was yeah. like, I'm not driving from West Orange to Great Adventure. That's about an hour and a half every day. I'm not doing that, especially when it snows. So when they did that, I said, I need another job. Started working for Tommy Hilfiger because now I can do accounts receivable. I know all this stuff. I'm working with Tommy Hilfiger. Get the Tommy Hilfiger. I'm never going to forget it. I'm processing, and I wouldn't buy 
thing from Tommy Hilfiger because by that time I understood that they made underwear, right? Put Tommy Hilfiger on it, but Jockey was the manufacturer. <laughs> they made jeans, put Tommy you Hilfiger tell them all on the secrets it. right now, huh? Because hmm. I'm telling you, like, this is kind of stuff we don't know. They made jeans, put Tommy Hilfiger on it, but Pele was the manufacturer. I'm like, really? So people kind of frowned on Pele a little bit because they had Tommy Hilfiger and Tommy Hilfiger was was like just like a um it was a, it was a private label and and Pele was a manufacturer. So I hated that job because again I was in accounting, which I had went to college for and didn't like it when I was in college. Came out of that job, so I added a newspaper by starting your own business. Went to this meeting, it was February, it was cold. There was a guy inside the building it was like six of us lined up, 60 of us lined up outside. We get to the door. He let us in. When we get inside the room, there was money hanging from street on strings from the ceiling. So everybody walking in and we're looking around like, what is this about? Now, what really intrigued me was it was a perfume business. Everybody that knows me know I love perfume. I love, love, love perfume. Right. I'm thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to have a perfume business. I was excited. The money hanging from the ceiling. The guy comes in. He has on no socks. He has on white shoes. It's like he just came from Miami. I felt like Miami Vice at that point because he had a long ponytail. He was real tan. It's February in Jersey. It's cold. He got on a taste <laughs> pan. And so he was telling us how we could start our own perfume company. We just had to take these boxes of perfume and show them that we could sell the perfume. And once we did that, they was going to open up our own perfume store. And I'm thinking, well, I live in West Orange. My store is going to be in Bloomfield, you know, because Bloomfield and West Orange, like, you know, ooh, uppity, we suburbs. Yeah. So that's what I'm thinking. And so I take this box of perfume home and I sell it to everybody. I come back. He said, like, got to sell another box. I take another box. I go sell it. Then he said, now you got to go on the streets and sell. So remember back in the day, Tamika, when you see people walking around when they pull in the cars and they selling you stuff on the street, they selling yeah. some knives or some hats. That was me selling the perfume, right? So from February to April of that year, I walked in the cold rain sleet selling perfume. I was making $1 a bottle. I think people bought the bottles of perfume for $20 because they felt sorry for me because I'm like spraying like smell this. And I'm telling my spill about the perfume. And, you know, if you like Calvin Klein, but you can't afford it, you can afford hours to smell just like Calvin Klein for like $20 and people would buy it. I think they just felt sorry for me. I made $1 per bottle. That's it. Mm -hmm. And I realized at that point I wasn't making any money, but I was free. If that even makes any sense. Yeah. I wasn't making any money, but I was free and I was free to go out there every day and just do my thing. And that's what made me decide I need to go full force into this entrepreneurship thing. And that's what I did. And so that's when my journey started. That's wow. Started. That was a beautiful story. Now, I'd love to know just a little piece of the ending there. So you now realize this, but what business did you go into as like when you left your job? Was it the perfect business? Nope. The first business I went into was financial services. Huh? So, <laughs> yep, that was my first business. So wait, what wait, happened? Wait, 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 wait. Let me let me ask you a question. So why didn't you continue with the perfume? Was it because you looked at the the amount of um, basically what your return was? Did we you say it was a scam? Hmm? We realized we realized at that point that it was a scam. Oh, like okay. So this wasn't we a good sold business. so many bottles of perfume and nobody ever got a store. Like it was a bunch okay. of us because everybody wanted a store. And I picked Bloomfield. He's like, where do you want your stuff? Like Bloomfield. You know, that's why I wanted my store. And I don't know why I picked Bloomfield, but I picked Bloomfield. After by, by the time April rolled around, we realized it was a scam and we had been scammed. We were okay. just selling perfume for them and we weren't making any money and nobody ever got a store. Because it was like, you're going to get it next week. You're going to get it next week. And it never happened. But I realized this may not be my business, but I love this whole entrepreneurship thing. And so the first business that I went into was financial services. I went to a meeting and they showed me the rule of 72. And I was thinking, now remember, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a numbers person. Like I like math and I like science. And I'm like, mm -hmm. right. And I got my license to be an insurance agent. And that's how I got into it. But what was crazy about that? I was I was talking to my friend. I was like, you should come into this business with me. So we went into we were at a business opportunity meeting. I was working in pharmaceutical at the time. And I said, you know, I had this idea for this fat doll. She said, what you mean? I was like a plus size fashion doll. Have you ever seen a fat doll before? And she's like, no. Nah. She said, but I'm a doll collector. And I said, are you? She said, yes. Yeah. She said, come by the house tonight. So I go by her house. Right. 
she had just bought this doll that was designed by Byron Lars, right? He's a big designer for Mattel. She paid $250 for that doll. I said, you spent $250 for a doll? She's like, yeah. I was like, oh my God, we're going to be rich. That's what I said. No, we're going to be rich. She said, all I want to know is can I be the vice president? And I was like, yep. And so we launched what I call my first real business. So I invented the first plus size fashion dolls. They were called big beautiful dolls. Yeah. And I call it my first real business because I had to learn how to manufacture a doll like from my head to paper, to clay, to wax, to a manufacturer in China. And I never set foot in China a day in my life, get it back to the United States and then sell it. I had to learn all that. I had to learn how to do, I had to learn how to raise money to get that done. I was, I spent a year on wall street talking to people trying to raise money for this company and people laughed at it. I was like, nobody want to buy a fat doll. That's what they kept telling me. And I said, like, somebody's going to buy this doll. And I was relentless. We got the money. We produced the doll and the dolls were born. They came back into the, to the United States, 2001 into California. That's where our port was. And they went on strike at the port. So we missed the whole Christmas season. The dolls just sat on a barge. Womp, womp. <laughs> oh, God. It was crazy. But I call it my first real business because I had to learn so much about so many things. I had to learn what investing really was. I had to learn how to manufacture. I had to learn how to protect my intellectual property and my physical property. And I call it my first real business. So we kind of pushed financial services to the side and went straight into being uh, doll creators. And I ran that business for five years. Until I was just burned out completely because it was a lot of traveling. It was a lot of doll shows. It was a lot of just just a lot of headache when it came to like getting stuff from China. Like if you ever manufacture anything in China, the manufacturing part of it takes very little time to get it back, to get it back over. Here. Especially if it's traveling by sea, it takes about three months. And it's crazy. So right now I can't even imagine what it's like for people trying to get stuff out of China right now. Like I tried to, the dolls turned 21 years old. La not last year, year before last. And it was my 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 goal was to have an anniversary edition, right? And I called my manufacturer, who's been my manufacturer from the day I started. I was like, listen, I want this doll. The numbers they told me made me cringe. I was like, there is no way I could send $400,000 to China right now. They hate our president. They hate us. Like, I cannot see me sending that type of money, even though that has been my manufacturer for so long. I could not do it. I, and I told my mother, I started having like sleepless nights. I was like, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't do it. And, she, and my mother loved the dolls. Like she thought that was the best thing I had ever done. And she loved those dolls. And she was like, I think you should try. And when I told her what I had to do, I said, Ma, I can't do it. I can't, I can't even sleep. And I hadn't sent the dime anywhere. I couldn't even sleep to me. I was so stressed out about just sending that type of money to China. Cause at that time our tariff laws were being challenged because the president put all these tariffs against China. China was pissed off at us. So my yeah. prices were like, off the chain, like they were charging us so much money. I was like, I can't, I can't do it. I can't, I can't do it. So I just, I just put that to the side. I said, maybe one day I'll bring them back. I can't bring them back right now because we have, we don't have good relationship with China right now. We just don't. And so that, that begins my first real business. And then after I got burned out so much, I became a consultant for um, Rutgers University Small Business Development Center. Wait a minute. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Yep. Your your story goes in and out of entrepreneurship and working for other companies. So, like, it sounds like consistently you're still holding a nine to five in between no, all of this. No, 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 no. I stopped. I stopped my nine to five in '99. I haven't worked a nine. I, I worked one time in 2003 when I was getting ready to get married. From '99 to 2003, no full time job. When I got ready to get married, I wanted to have a big wedding, so I got a job at the county jail. Right. Worked there three months. I was like, oh, the heck with this. I'm just going to have a small wedding and quit that job and went back to being an entrepreneur. Like, no way. I can't do this. So I haven't had a full-time job like for a long period of time since 1999. Okay. But what happened was when you become a consultant with, with the SBDC, you're not really a working really for them. You're kind of like an independent consultant. Contractor. Okay. Yeah, contractor. So what happened was they had two programs. I was a consultant with King University Small Business Development Center and Rutgers at the same time. And um, and then I became a mentor at the uh, Douglas campus. They had a women's entrepreneurship program. I became a mentor for that, too. But they had a contract and they needed consultants. So they brought me on and I was consulting with startups on how to start a business. You know, the whole thing, how to start, how to launch. And I, I met some interesting people. I met people who wanted to start. Like, I, I'm never going to forget this one woman. She goes, I want to start a cupcake business. And I was like, well, do you know how to bake? And she was like, no. I said, well, you might want to start right there. 
Yeah. You got to be me. <laughs> And so I did that for about three years and then I branched off on my own and I started doing coaching. So and I wrote a bunch of books about, you know, how to start a business, you know, how to how to how to write a book. Like I, I wrote a book on how to start a business and then people started asking, well, how do I write the book? So I said, well, let me write a book on how to write a book. So I did that. We <laughs> shared that. I, I wrote that. I did that webinar. Actually, yeah. I have a course on that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, how to write a book. Right. How many like, books well, have you written? How many books have you written? To date, I think I've written eight. Yeah, I'm in that. I'm like, I stopped counting after a while because some are actually physical, some yes. are ebooks. So it's just like so many books all over the place. Like, oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah. and then you know, what's crazy is I haven't really, I haven't really did a course course. Like I do live podcast trainings, but I haven't done a course course. Like you know how everything is laid out, and I don't know if I really like that model. Like I, I looked at your website and I was like, I like the webinar model. I think I like that. To me, that's better me. Like, let's do a webinar and call it a day. Like, oh, I got to put this piece together. It's got to be three seconds and this got to be. I don't know if I like that model yet. So I'm trying to. But you know what? Here, here's the thing with the courses. It's like the times have changed and people like hearing the word course. So I'll tell you one of the things that I did. Mm -hmm. I took a bunch of the videos that I had created that I had either done a video or there was like a live webinar and I dropped them into the course. You know what I'm saying? So you can literally take some stuff that you've already, you know, already recorded and drop it in and just add a few other things in there, some resources and, um, you know, if they need to know about pricing structures and anything. And you take what you have and you create it as a course. So here's the real thing. Nine times out of 10, the people that are buying the course, they might not have been connected to you before. So even yeah. if that product was out somewhere before, you take a bunch of them and put them together, make them more valuable, and that's the course. Girl, you yeah. done put me on something because I, you know, it's so funny because, yeah, okay, yeah, I, yeah, I didn't think about that. I'm thinking because I, you know, I've looked at courses and I've written plenty of books. And I'm like, okay, I need to turn some of these books into courses because courses are hot right now. I take plenty of them. Like I'm always on if I take course, take course. And I don't have my own course, but I'm always pumping everybody else's course. So, um, but I have them, I have them recorded as webinars. And when I went to your website, I was like, I like, I like this model. Like this is, I like this, you know, I don't want to be having to break it down and all. I like just, let me just get through what I got to say. And, you know, but, but if you look at some of the course creators, they tell you, well, it shouldn't be this long. All my courses like 90 minutes, like my webinars are like 90 minutes. I'm like, okay, I don't feel like going to be breaking all that stuff up. So I kind of like, okay, I get to it. So that's a great idea. Look at this. Here's the crazy thing. You can literally take the 90 minute webinar that you did. And that is the whole course. You take yes. that 90 minutes and just get, and I know you're like, I don't really want to break it up. Get someone to take it and break it yeah. down. Like you to watch your own 90 minute course, right? I do. You say at, at 10 minutes, this is module one at uh, 15 minutes, which is five more minutes. That's the second one. Yeah. And then you could even go back in and shoot some little small videos that you could put in between. Mm -hmm. And you could say, hey, guys, on this next next module, this is what's happening, blah, blah, blah. And that's a little video. And that yeah. just drops in between the rest of the stuff. Like Girl, literally taking stuff that you already had. So I'm, put, I'm pulling together a new course that was a course. I'm doing the same thing right now. And this came to me like just recently. I was like, a duh. You have all yeah. of this stuff. It's so valuable because really at the end of the day, people just want information. And then they want it from a reliable source. They want it from a person who's been doing the thing, who's proven that they were doing the thing, you know? Yeah. So, and you've done a lot so far. So people have no reason, you know, to say, oh, I'm not going to trust her stuff. Like you've done a lot. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good thank you for sharing it because I, you know, I was like, I need to put together a course. And I, you know, I took some courses on courses. I'm like, oh God, like really? And some lady told me I do the whole thing for like ten thousand dollars. Like, I bet you will. Like, girl, nah. I was like, my like listen, I don't, I'm not listen. If I gotta sit down and turn this camera on, I got cameras all around this room and packed up, I'll do it, you know. But um, I got like you said, I have a lot of content and I have so much content to make And you're right, because at the end of each show, I, you know, I give a word of inspiration. Right. And I was talking to my SEO guy. He's like, well, do you realize I, I just I just I'm over 500 episodes on my Good Morning Gwinnett podcast. Oh, girl, <laughs> I, hit that. I hit that the first of this year to be there. OK, 
And, and you know what? I didn't even realize it until my producer, like, Orange, you have, it, I think it was 490 something episodes. She told me, I was like, are we? And I had to go back and look. Now I had to keep track of the days. Like, okay, I got to make sure when I get to 500 that I, you know, celebrate 500. But inside of all of those episodes, it's always me talking about something business because at the end of the day, when they put me in the box, they'll say, here lies an entrepreneur. Let me tell you something. This is funny. At my mom's funeral, right? I'm a diehard entrepreneur, diehard to the day I, to the day I die. At her, at the repast after the funeral, there was a woman walking around. She had this thing on her neck. It was about this long, and I didn't know what it was. So my aunt comes to me. She said, hey, she said she wants to ask you a question. I was like, sure. So she's like, hi. She said, now, mind you, my mom died from COVID, right? Everybody in the room got masks on, so, you know, we're a little afraid. So the woman comes, she got this thing on about this long. She said, my name, I forgot her name. My name is such and such. And she says, this is an ionizer. And I was like, okay, what is an ionizer? She's like, this right here purifies the air in the room. And it, att it attacks COVID right at the at the beginning of the, at the door. And I was like, really? She said, yes. Yeah. And I just wanted to know if it was okay if I shared this with everybody. So I said, listen, I said, I'm an entrepreneur, ma'am. I said, and you are in the perfect group right now to share this information. And it was the truth because my mom had just passed from COVID. And I said, so I made it. I, I cracked the joke. I said, my mom is laughing right now and saying, this girl is doing business at my funeral. But at the core of who I am, that's who I am. And so I let the woman do this. I let her talk about that ionizer. She would have made so much money if she had anything for us to purchase at, that, at my mom's repast. Everybody was ready to like, so how much does it cost? People was pulling out their credit card. She had nothing to sell. No website, no business cards, no product. Oh, oh, there's a lesson in this story. She, she had nothing to sell. Me and my brother, we were like, we want one for like, my house is kind of big. I like, I need like two. Like I need one that's going to cover the whole bottom floor and the whole top floor. She's like, well, you need this. I said, okay, so how do I get that? She's like, um, let me, I got it. She never got back to me. My cousins, we were. All, it was about fifty of us in that room. She would have made a killing because I think the the lowest one was two hundred dollars, and that was the one around your neck. I wanted the one for the house, like I wanted to attack as soon as it walked in the front door. She had nothing for us, so you know that was crazy. And what was her purpose for speaking? She wanted to let us know about it, and I guess it was her her hope to sell it. And she was like, "Our website will be up next week." I'm like, "Yeah, by next week, by the by the by the end of this day, my, my mind is fried right now. I'm going back to to Atlanta. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna probably look at your website after that. You should have had something right now. Like I would have been like, "Listen, I gotta here's my here's my square. Um, just swipe your card. That's what I would have been doing." Like so, the lesson in entrepreneurship right now is be prepared. Put all your ducks in a row. Cross yeah. your T's and dot your I's. Have all of the things that allow people to see what you have available. Um, just get your business structure set up. Everything, right. yeah, yeah. And you know, um, I actually started a membership, which is called Underground Biz Group. And mm -hmm. it is just for that, like what you were just saying, to help people who are either already entrepreneurs and don't have everything together, or those who are already started, and they just don't know what else, like they're like, so either they're just starting or they, um, or they just don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And, um, mm -hmm. it just provides a space for them to come in every, every week and learn these different things. So like I, sh I shared that just now because we're on the same path with yeah. making sure entrepreneurs get this information. So yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Cause you shared you know, that earlier that you like to make sure that people understand about business structure. They need to. I was at. A, I was at a. Um. We. My husband and I. We went to a vendor. Um. They had like a. They do a lot of stuff in Gwinnett County, but it was like an outside. I don't know, spring something, but you were outside, and so I was out there promoting Good Morning Gwinnett and trying to get people to download my app and things like that. And my husband has a hot dog cart. Like that's his thing. He got a hot dog cart, so he had the hot dog cart right there, and I was over here with my table with for Good Morning Gwinnett, and we were just having a great time. And um. I was taking the money for the hot dogs. And so he makes these amazing onions and people were like lined up. Like once they realized our hot dogs were the cheapest there and he had these great onions, he had a line. And so I was taking the money and this guy comes around, all he has is a credit card. Now here's the funny thing. People will expect you not to be prepared. He's like, well, do you take 
He said, he says, I don't have any cash. I'm sure you don't take credit cards. Oh, yeah, we, you got the hot dog in your hand. We take credit card. Like, give me a card. And I pulled my square out. And the crazy thing was the square wouldn't work for some reason. He's like, oh, my God. I said, that's okay. That's all right. I can take it out and we can punch it in. Let's just give it to me. Right. People don't expect you to be prepared. And you have yeah. to be prepared because you never know where a cell is going to come from. And so, you know, you got PayPal that will send you the, the card reader. You got Square that will send you the card reader. Just be prepared. I had a... I bought the I have the 11 the iPhone 11 when it first came out of course all of the all of the this readers had the other the um other adapter on the end so the iPhone 11 you I'm like oh my god how am I going to use my square well, guess what I did I had to go out and buy an adapter to put on my phone you got to be right. prepared you got to be prepared yeah. um at one point in time because I do uh, you know since covid things have changed but I was doing a lot of trade shows and we would also have a form so mm -hmm. just in case we couldn't get um, Wi-Fi, we had the form that people would be able to fill out. People don't really like leaving their credit card numbers on a form, but when you're a reputable business, you know, they will yeah. actually go ahead and, and do that. So yeah, we had that as a backup as well. And I'm glad mm -hmm. that you shared that tip about, um, and just to be clear, that sometimes when a transaction doesn't actually go through, you can still do that. You can input it yes. and um, it actually can be held in your device just to clear that yes. up. So like yeah. you can put their information in and it actually goes on hold until you get on Wi-Fi and then yeah. the transaction actually goes through. That's right. So yeah, it's a little sketchy and scary because you want them, you hope that they actually have the funds, but <laughs> right. it's another way of still making the sale. And nine That's times right. out of 10, the people have the money in their account. Nine times yeah. out of 10. So. Nine times out of 10, they do. Yeah. Yeah. So um, um, this has been whew, this has been a great interview. You know, I'm just glad that we were able to have like some casual conversation and I'm glad that you shared so much with us. So yeah. you're um, so you're in love with finances and assisting people, getting them, you know, the information about about um, understanding finances. And um, you're also in love with podcasting. So when we had a conversation, you were telling me about the depth of podcasting. So can we talk just a little bit about how deep it can go as far as a person that wants to be a podcaster? Like anything that you can share about like the journey of being a podcaster? What should someone know, like starting up? So the first thing I would say is, why do you want to be a podcaster, right? That's the first thing. You need to start with your why. I'm sure you've heard that plenty of times. Start with your why. You want to start with why. Because your why is going to determine how seriously you take this industry. And this is an industry. When it first started out, it was kind of like a side thing. Now it is a huge industry. And to put that in perspective for you, Facebook just said, we're going to do podcasting. Mm -hmm. Go figure. Know why? Because audio is big. And when they saw that, Clubhouse got this humongous billion dollar valuation. They were like, we need to get in this game, which they should have been in it, but they didn't. But when Clubhouse popped off, they did. Podcasting. What did you just say? Facebook has podcasting. Pod, Facebook is about to get podcasting. Oh, they're getting ready to. Yes. What? Yes. Yep. Yep. So before Facebook, before everybody, Apple was a big daddy in podcasting. This is just a little industry history. Apple, what that the podcast came from. The podcast player that Apple brought out. That's how we got to podcasting. They were the big daddy. Then Spotify came up and shook it up a little bit. It's like, nah, nah, nah. We need some of this. We need some of this real estate right here. We need some of this market share. Then Amazon came right behind us, like, mm -mm -mm, y'all not playing here by yourself. We need to be in this game. Now Pandora jumped in and said, Well, we want to get in too, but we're not letting everybody in. Right. Mm -hmm. We're not letting everybody. In. So Pandora actually has podcasts on it, but they're not letting everybody in like Apple and Spotify, and Amazon. Amazon said, nah, nah, nah. Well, since you're trying to do that, now we're going to make Apple's uh, Amazon Music a part of the podcast. So not, not only are you on Amazon, you're on Amazon Music. So now podcasting is on Amazon Music. Now, Facebook is saying, well, wait a minute. Everybody get in the podcast game. I, we need to be in the game. So Mark said, we got to throw our hat in the ring. What does that mean for you and I? That means that you need to think about why you want to start it. What is it going to be? Is it you sharing stories? Is it a business podcast? What is it going to be? Are you trying to build a brand? Or are you trying to use it as a marketing tool? What is it going to be? For me, Good Morning Gwinnett is a brand that I'm building. Wise Women in Breast is a Invest is a brand that I'm building. So everything I do has a whole lot of branded aspects to it like like i had for well, good morning Gwinnett, i had mobile apps 
Like, if you got an Android or Apple, you can download my app. Um, if you have an Alexa in your house, you can listen to my podcast. If you got a Fire Stick, you can watch me on, on that. If you got a Roku, you can watch me. It's the brand that I'm building. But that means I have to be on all these platforms. Now, some people say, well, Audrey, you're not going to get that much traction right now on all those platforms. Nope. But as, as I'm building a brand, I need to be on all those platforms. And my model, the model that I follow is Netflix. I follow Netflix. My, by the way, they're about to get into podcasting. Oh, wow. Ooh. Let me ask you a question. How much time does it take for you to be on all of these platforms? Like how much time on the back end to actually make sure you're loaded into all of these different locations? So because everything is automated, Tamika, it's so cool. I set it up one time and it just syndicates. So to give you a prime example, on podcasting, on mostly all the podcasting platforms, whether you use Spreaker, Lipson, Buzzsprout, Blueberry, Squadcast, whatever you use, Anchor, they're already automatically syndicated for you. So what you have to make sure you do is that you have to have an Apple account for your podcast and you have to have a Google account. And then you have to connect yourself through your podcast platform to all of those different platforms and it syndicates out. So when you put your podcast up there, Buzzsprout or whoever you use is going to syndicate it out for you. I use Spreaker. And the reason I use Spreaker is because I had live calling people that called into my show before I started doing video. And they were the only platform that let me do calling. And they actually own Block Talk. So I started out with Block Talk. They got a little janky. And, and they, they didn't give me what I needed. Like for me, it was live, live streaming my show. I needed people to go to my website because I was trying to drive that traffic back there. And Spreak, and Block Talk allowed that, but I had to pay $250 a month. I paid Spreaker $19. I have multiple podcasts on my network. And I, and you can go to my Good Morning Gwinnett website and it says live, just like it's saying right now. That's why I chose them. So you have to pick your, you have to figure out, you know, what platform is going to work for me. They will syndicate that information out. Now, if you want to get on Apple and Amazon and all those things, you can do all of those things. And it's the same thing. Like once you attach everything together, it syndicates it out. When I take my RSS feed and I put it in Alexa, I don't have to do anything. I don't never have to go to Alexa again because my RSS feed is pulling from my shows and it's going to pull the most right into Alexa. And if you got an echo dot in your house, you can say open up Good Morning Gwinnett and it plays the recent, most recent episode. Same thing with my Fire TV channel, the exact same thing. The only one I have to spend a little time on is my Roku channel because it does not have where you can feed it directly in. I have to actually put it in. And so what I do is only on my, um, the only shows that I put in there are the shows with video. That's it. For Amazon and Alexa, it's automatically fed to that, those platforms. So to my mobile app, everything is automatic. And so I don't have to do anything to those platforms. Roku is the only one I have to go hands on with because of that. How did you and learn what, all of this? Go ahead. Fi finish your statement. Um, so when I moved to Georgia, when I moved from Jersey to Georgia, I didn't know anybody here. And I went to go get my hair done. There was a young lady there. She was getting her hair done. It was her birthday. She invited me to come to a film festival. I go to this film festival in Decatur. I get to the festival. I'm sitting in the front of the room, and this guy's talking about distribution for filmmakers. He said to them, and I'm sitting at the front, he said to them, we can distribute your film for you to all of these places. He, and so he said Walmart, and everybody lost their mind. Oh, my God, my film's going to be in Walmart. He said, but you probably won't see any return on that for like 15 years. And I was like, did he say 15 years? I said, 15 years? He said, 15 years. And so by that time, I had been in the, the book publishing industry for a minute since 98. So I'm like, wait a minute. You can go and put your book on one of these self-publishing platforms. And I think the big one at the time was CD, not, not CD Baby, um, something. It was um, Book Something, Book Baby. It was Book Baby. You can go to Book Baby and they would distribute it out for you. You're going to see a, at least a dime. And so he was saying, you know, you're not going to see anything. And so on my way back home, I was thinking it's got to be a way to help the filmmakers get their content out there. And so the first thing I did, I was like, God, I need a, I need a, I need a way to help them. And he told me to launch a TV network called HerTube. And I'm like, HerTube? So I was like, okay, let me see what that entails. So I set up an online TV network through Ning. So Ning was the, one of the first community social platforms out there where you can build your own community. It was called N-I-N-G Ning, right? 
And I went to Ning and I was like, I'm trying, I'm building this network. And I went and I, and I was like, okay, who's going to build a network? So I put out all the thoughts to all my entrepreneurial friends. Like, listen, I'm launching this TV network. Women is called her to do you want to be on people? Like I got to be on TV. I got to get on the camera. I'm like, well, yeah, it's a TV network. Right. And I went to filmmakers and they were like, yeah, but I don't know. I'm trying to get this meal with Netflix. And so was that kind of thing. I'm like, man, this is, this is crap. Like, Nobody wants to be on this network with me. So I'm like, okay, God, you told me to do this. Who am I talking to? He said, talk to people that want to be on TV. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I put an ad in Backstage Magazine. So Backstage is an industry publication for people that's in the film industry. I put an ad in Backstage, a digital ad. Hey, having auditions, launching a new TV network. This is what you need to do to, to audition. They had to send a picture. They had to send a mini reel. They had to send a bio. And they had to send that stuff to us in a, in a, in a, a, on a deadline. 300 women sent me that information. Then they had some other stuff they had to do. Out of that 300, 39 did that. Then we had to interview them. After we interviewed them, 19, we, 19 women were like, okay, let's work with these. We worked with 19 women from California to Canada that produced content for her tube. And that's how I got into the streaming industry space. So Ning wasn't giving me everything that I needed. So I decided to get my own platform built. And I went to India. I, I, I went online. I said, hey, I went to, I think I went to Upworks at the time. I was like, I need to get this done. And so it was a barrier with language. It was a barrier with time. I was having all kinds of problems with them. So I'm just wasting money, burning money, trying to get this, this platform built. So then there was a guy at my church who said, I could do it. Now, what he didn't know was is that I am a little techie myself. I couldn't do that, but I was like, so he sent me a wireframe of a WordPress site with nothing on it. He's like, I'm getting it done. I was like, you ain't did nothing. He didn't think he didn't yeah. know I know that. So he tried to be, he tried to play me off. And so the person that introduced us, you know, I was like, I'm about to sue all y'all because y'all playing games. And so they was like, nah, we're gonna give you your money back. They gave me back my money. And then I just for three months, I just put my head down. And I said, I'm gonna figure this out. And so after three months, I figured it out, and my first Roku channel was born October 2013. Her tube went live on Roku. And wow. at that time, Amazon Fire TV wasn't ready yet. So Amazon Fire TV came out in 2014. And then once they came out, I learned how to do that and I put us on 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 Roku. I mean on Amazon. And so that's how I got into that whole thing. And now my noise media network is on Apple, Roku, Amazon, and Android. A lot of people don't know Android, don't even know Android make TV what they do. Matter of fact, most of the new TVs that come out. Are built on the Android platform. Uh -huh. Wow! So you have a network called Noise Media Network. What's the name Noise Media, Noise network. Media network. So, and then um, HerTube is what? HerTube TV Network. So there's two networks. Two networks. Okay. One specifically just for women, and the other one has different channels for other things. And that's okay. pretty new. Like I launched that in nineteen. And I, I launched it in 19 because I used to get so much flack from men. Like, what about us? And I was like, yeah, but it's a, it's a woman's network. You know, it's like, what about us? You never include us. Even with even with me talking about wise women invest, I get a lot of flack. Like, you don't think men want to know how to invest? I'm like, I know, but but my passion is helping women. You, know? yeah, you, you can learn. Your audience. You have to know who you really want to talk yeah. to. Yeah. yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So um, with this network, these two networks that you have, is it just your stuff on the network or do you invite others on to your network to put their um, their media there or, or not? I do. So what happened was I invite others to come on both networks and I always have, which is kind of funny. And I would, let me tell you the pushback I would get. And then I'll tell you the recent pushback I got. Not recent, but like over the years. The first pushback I would get was I got to be on video. I'm like, well, yeah, it's TV. People want to see you on TV. That was the first. Then the second pushback I would get because you have to pay. It was like, well, why would I do that when I could be on YouTube? And I was like, you, you don't have to. You know, like my thing was, I'm not trying to explain anything to you. I'm telling you that you're going to be on TV. To me, in my mind, as an entrepreneur growing a business, that's all I needed to hear. Like, I'm going to be on TV. But that's not everybody. And when you live in a world where there's so much free content, that's why we were talking about earlier. There are podcast platforms out there right now that will let you have a subscription to your podcast, but you're going to get a lot of pushback and you got to do a lot of audience building because people say, well, why should I listen when I can go to Apple and listen to millions for free? And by the way, there are 2 million podcasts out right now. Compare that to YouTube channels, not a lot, but there are 2 million. Um, so I got a lot of pushback about I don't want to pay. And I'm like, fine, don't pay. It got so bad with that part. So I was like, I ain't putting nobody on my network. I know the power of my network. I'm going to be on my own network. So mm -hmm. right now on, on 
her tube, I think I have 165 videos. Most of them are produced by other women. On noise, I have mostly all my stuff, and I have one channel, one podcast channel that's produced by one by somebody else, and one video channel. And so I open it up to people that want to be on it, but I'm not going to try to beg you to be on it because I know the power. So what I decided to do was I said, you know what, I'm going to. So so the next thing that happened was people like, well, I want to, I want my own branded channel. So I started building branded channels for people. Which that was fun because I could get that. I'm about branding my channel. I got that. I said, okay, fine. So this is this is a young kid. I don't know if you ever heard him. His name is the Truth Jones, Christian the Truth Jones. He's a freaking genius in stock market. Like um, he's a so he and I spoke at a conference together. He said to me, What did he say to me? I'm amazed by you. I was like, heck no, but he was like 10 years old. Like, you amazed at me. I'm amazed at you, you 10 years old. Got more money than me. It was crazy. But I started building channels for other people on fight on um Amazon. And um mm-hmm. Because people wanted their own branded channel. And so now I'm putting together a whole academy to do just that, to put them on all of those platforms. So, and, and the trainings are simple. They're 90-minute trainings. And so you'll come out, you'll have an Alexa channel, you have a Fire TV channel, and a Roku channel. And that's that's for the podcaster that wants to brand. So you asked me earlier about what you need to know. What are you trying to do? If you're trying to build a brand, you want to be on those platforms. Because think about this. When you sit down and look at TV, there's no button for you to push on TV to buy, to buy Pringles. Or to buy cores, you can't push a button on TV. Know why? Because they're interested in introducing their brand to you and sending you somewhere. You got to think about it like that. And a lot of people don't think about it like that. You can't push nothing on TV and say, now when they get to that point, it's going to be game changer. But at this point right now, it hasn't been that way in the last 75 years where you can push a button on TV and say, order that. You can't do it. Not yet. Um, it's probably coming, but you can't. So you have to think from think about it from that perspective. What are you trying to build? Are you trying to build a brand? You're just trying to have fun. You just want to tell stories. You're into true crime. You know, what are you trying to do? Yeah. And so that's that's what you got to figure out about your podcast. Well, this this was this was some really great information about all aspects of entrepreneurship that you are um, that you've been into. So in closing, I really want to know you've done a lot of things over these years you had these different businesses so much has happened what were the pitfalls where if you could go back and you had the doll business you had um all of these different things what would you actually change or tell someone not to do based upon your life pick one thing Mm -hmm. one Pick one thing. I can tell you when I started the doll business, I I always go back to that business because that was the one thing and that was the only thing we did for five years. That was it. We didn't do any. You can you can drag us into anything. You couldn't dangle nothing in front of our face. It was all about dolls. Who buys these dolls? How do I get them made? Where am I shipping? That was all it was about. And when I and but what ha- what happens is when you become an entrepreneur and you start learning about stuff. Every shiny object that come into your face like this, you want to jump on it. And I'm, I was guilty. I was guilty of that. So I would tell any entrepreneur, like, yeah, you're gonna, people are gonna come to you with opportunities. I've been doing this for 24 years. So you, can you imagine the opportunities I had to say no to? Had I not, I'd be losing my mind right now. But some of them yeah. I said yes to. Some of them flopped. Like I've launched, I've launched, I launched another TV network like three years ago with five people. They wanted to launch one. They put the money in. We, Nobody wanted to do the work after that. I'm like, listen, I'm the tech person. You guys said you were going to, we had roles. We had a partnership agreement. This is what you had to do, right? And I made sure that we did that because here's the other thing, Tamika. When you work with people, everybody need to know their role. Right. Because I'm creative and you creative. Nothing is going to get done on the business side. It's not going to happen because we're both creatives. Even if I say, well, I'm going to handle the accountant, but I want to be over here and I want to be drawing and on Canva and all that stuff. The accountant is going to suffer. Right. Because I'm a creative and that's why I want to spend my time. But I have agreed to do the accounting because nobody wants to do it. Well, I do it. But yet I want to spend my time on camera making stuff pretty. It's not going to work. And so we had a we launched a TV. It was called Baki. Right. I love I love thinking outside the box. So Baki stands for black and African, African. Right. And it was just a black TV network. It's called Baki, B-A-K-I. It's called Baki TV. People was they was excited about it. Oh my God, you know, because we were like, listen, this is our TV network. You could put content on it, you could share your story, because you could. The team fell apart because nobody did what they were supposed to do. Yeah. And I was like, 
I'm the tech person. Let me stay in my lane. I don't want to run the business. That's not what we agreed to. We agreed that I make sure that we were on all these platforms and people around the world could get our content. That's what we agreed to. You agreed to go out and find sponsors. You agreed to go out and find the content. Let me handle the tech, right? It didn't happen mm -hmm. like that. So I would say make sure you know what you want to do and pick that one thing for right now. Yes, we are multi-talented. We are. You know, we have the capacity to do more than one thing at one time. But when I was focused on the dolls, I was focused on the dolls. When I learned that I could focus on all these other things, I went buck wild crazy. Uh -huh. I went buck wild. Have you so, figured out where the money really is, like in regards to doing all of these different businesses? Because, you know, it, with entrepreneurship, there's like so much that we could actually do. And we are like learning about different things, as you said. But then we get to the point where this particular business takes a lot of time and energy and effort, which all of them take that. But this one takes much more. So mm, while I thought it was kind of fun, I really want to make the money. You know, so are you kind of looking at things like that right now? No, I'm not. And, and I tell you why, because I was looking, if you would have asked me that same question five years ago, yes, that's exactly where I was because I, I like doing this. And, and I stopped doing podcasting for a while for that very reason. Like I did podcasting from 2009 to about 2013. And I was like, man, I ain't making no money. I love doing this, but I got to make some money. So then I, I was consulting. I was making all my money in consulting and coaching and things like that. But I love podcasting. And I went back in 2015, like, I'm going to just do it. Right. But then I'm like, I got to help. I got to help my husband. He's going to kick me out the family. Right. right. I got to make some money. And I was like, I stopped again. And then 2018, I was like, I'm going full force in. This is all I'm going to do. But what happened was because I do this so much, I started getting a lot of consulting gigs. I, I started doing a lot of training on podcasting and the money started rolling. I'm like, oh, yeah, now I'm now I'm where I'm supposed to be. I'm in the thing that I love. And people are coming to me because they're knowing me for podcasting. I'm speaking at conferences. Mm -hmm. Question: Are you saying that you ended up having exposure? So the other things that you were doing, the money came in on the outside of the podcasting, or was the money on the inside of the podcasting? On the outside. So because I was podcasting and talking to it, the money, the money never comes from. It never came from podcasting. Like I can't tell you. Well, let me see. No, I can't even tell you that. Nobody's ever said, "Or we want to pay you," except for the to 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 run a, a thirty five dollar shout out. You know, that was some money. I probably could have focused on that, but I'm like, man, I want to do that. I want some real money. And yeah. so my real money comes from consulting and coaching and training. That's where the real money comes from. But it's because I run my mouth four days a week and I'm always oh, talking no. about podcasting. And people like, they, so at the Black Chamber, they call me the podcast queen. They gave me that name. I'm like, oh, I'm going to hold on to that name. Okay, that's what you think about me? Great. So, you know, so then I started putting myself out there more, just talking about podcasts in all these different spaces. Like I spoke at She Podcast. I spoke at PodFest like three times already. I spoke at the, the Land and Black Chamber about podcasts and getting your podcast on Alexa. I did trainings about these things. So it's out there now that Orgy loves podcasting. Even if I'm doing, you know, financial services, the first thing I'm saying, is I ain't talking about the financial, I'm doing a financial podcast. Right. So, so is feeding, it's, uh, this one yeah. thing is feeding something else. Yes. Yeah, I think that was a great tip. And I know that there are um, some avenues to making money in my or monetizing with your podcast. But um, clearly you're stating that you show up and you continue to speak and let people know how much information you actually have, which puts you in a position of being an authority on several things. So people see you. And then they contact you for a lot of other things which are relevant to you know what you're speaking about. So yeah. And you, you, I want to say this too. I remember back in the day when you would say that you had more than one thing that you were passionate about, right? People thought mm -hmm. you they called you scattered. And for a long time after someone called me scattered, like, yeah, you're all over the place. And I really wasn't. Like if you everybody that knew me, like personally knew me, they know I'm very organized when it comes to this stuff. Like I know how to, everything is compartmentalized. It's what it's supposed to be. I can tell you about, you know, and, and so you probably got a little gist of that from me talking on the show, right? I used to, I, I used to tell people that I did a podcast and I did financial services. I wouldn't say that because it was like, I'm all over the place. And then someone said to me, Audrey, millionaires have seven streams of income and they can tell you about each one of them. And I was like, what? Girl, that, that shift my whole perspective on a lot of things. But what I've learned is that they may have seven streams, but they're not trying to run all seven at one time. Or if they are, they got people that run 
certain things for them. So that's what I had to learn. So I stopped be I stopped being embarrassed to say, well, I have a I have a media company and I podcast, yeah. right? Exactly. I have a media company. I also help people with their money. I help them figure out what a fixed index annuity really is and what it ain't. You know, I mm -hmm. I got really clear about this is what I do. And so I know that for me, podcasting is a marketing platform, right? But I also yeah. realize when I say things like my show is called Good Morning Gwinnett, that's a branding. That's that could be branded like Good Morning America. I ain't crazy. I'm like, yeah. okay, that's that's catchy. Let me let me think about that. I got a podcast called the Wise Women Invest. So if somebody said to me, Well, you want to buy Good Morning Gwinnett, I could let it go if the price is right. It ain't a tax. Somebody else can go do Good Morning Gwinnett if the price is right. Yeah. It's pretty simple to follow because what I do know is I can pop up another one and call it Good Day Gwinnett. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, you know, it's not Audrey yeah. is Good Morning Gwinnett. It's not Audrey is Wise Women Invest. Noise yeah. Media, that's my company. They said, Audrey, we want to buy Noise Media. Okay, if the price is right. Why? Because I know I can start another one. So Yeah. I love it. I love it. it. It has been, oh my gosh, so good speaking with you. I know that whoever is out there listening has gotten like such a chunk of information about entrepreneurship for so many. You just, you share so much. I'm just, I'm just so grateful. I'm thankful for you being here and thankful for all of your strength and um, everything you've been through that you've been able to share with us. So we will close out because we would probably be here for another two or three hours <laughs> talking about all of the things that people actually need to know that you actually know. So I thank you so much for uh, being here today. And um, thank you for also um, uh, having me on your podcast as well. And I love the rhythm of how you actually move on your podcast. I want to share that as well. Yeah. Very down to earth and um, very conversational. So thank you. For having me as well. All right, welcome. so we'll close out. So you guys out there, listen, I hope that you had your pens out and your paper so that you could take notes. And if you did not take notes, you can just stop. You can rewind. You can listen to this as often as you like. We'd love for you to share this out to someone else who actually needs to hear the same information. So I'm going to close out by telling you guys that underground biz group is my thing and i want to make sure that you are joining a place where you get information just like what miss audrey just shared with all of you information about business is so important when you have the information we begin to be able to erase the fear and that's why people either don't start or don't continue because there is fear so the information is here so join us and we're going to close out. It's Coach Janika James. I'm over and out. Thank you, Audrey. Bye, You're everyone. very welcome. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye.